This is your generosity come to life. Our team in Karbala are busy assembling and delivering iftar packs with your donations. Witness the impact of your support as we reach out to feed the orphans, the vulnerable and the needy with 100 meals this Ramadan. We don't want to stop here. Please continue to contribute in helping to make a world of difference. Support Imam Hussein Charity today. Support the needy in Karbala. www.imamhusseincharity.com بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بسيدنا ومولانا أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام وجعلنا الله وإياكم من الطالبين بثأره بين يدي الإمام المنصور المؤيد المهدي من آل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد لا فتى إلا علي ولا سيف إلا ذو الفقار The sword Dhul Fiqar without a doubt is the most famous sword in the history of the religion of Islam. A sword that at one stage belonged to Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, and then was of course famously associated with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Wherever you go in the world today, you'll see that Muslims automatically recognize Dhul Fiqar, irrespective of whether you are Shia or not Shia. There is a particular love and a particular admiration and a particular adoration for Dhul Fiqar. Dhul Fiqar, of course, is sold worldwide. Many times you'll find people who may buy it in relation to a necklace or a pendant which they may gift. Some buy the bigger replicas of Dhul Fiqar which they place within their houses. And at the same time, you find, of course, that the name Dhul Fiqar becomes a name which is always synonymous with Imam Ali alayhi salam. As in one only has to see, for example, that when the whole world was gripped by the series of the Turkish history and the Ottoman Empire known as Ertugol, you found that right from the beginning, there was this depiction of the sword Dhul Fiqar 
as well as at the same time the lines la fata illa ali wa la sayfa illa dhul fiqar that there is no youth but ali and no sword but dhul fiqar even for myself growing up arguably a scene that gave me goosebumps was the first time that i watched the film the message in arabic of course everybody knows the film as film al risala and in that film we saw very clearly how in the battles of the early part of the religion of islam that some of the bravest warriors who were there were the likes of hamza bin abdul muttalib alayhi salam imam ali ibn abi talib alayhi salam amongst others and that famous scene that all of us have seen of the battle of badr where we see hamza introducing those who were with him he introduced Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam on that day and the first scene that emerged was of course the scene of Dhul Fiqar. Dhul Fiqar always is noticeable because of the way that it looks. When you see the double edge towards the tipping point you see automatically that a person knows that this is Dhul Fiqar. However, what is the history and significance of this sword? While many people love Dhul Fiqar, there are very few who know about the origin of Dhul Fiqar, the development of the history of Dhul Fiqar. Some also ask the question today that where is Dhul Fiqar? Because when you go to Istanbul and you go towards Topkapi, automatically you are told that this is Dhul Fiqar, the sword of Imam Ali alayhi salam. A person straight away while they're on holiday, while they're doing the tourism sites, automatically asks that is this really Dhul Fiqar? As in, is this really the sword of Imam Ali alayhi salam? Because you know worldwide, wherever you go, you'll always notice that whether you go to Turkey or you go to India or you go to Iraq or you go to Iran, wherever you go, there are always places that claim to have the relics of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to have the relics of, for example, the awliya of Allah. So you go to India and they'll tell you that over here we have a chain that belongs to Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. In Istanbul, Turkey, they'll say to you that over here is the Dhul Fiqar of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Over here they'll tell you this is the hair of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Here they'll tell you this is the turban of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Wherever we go, sometimes one asks the question, but how many of these are reliable and authentic and how many are not? And how did the sword of Imam Ali alayhi salam get to Istanbul? Obviously, the Ottoman Empire, without a doubt, was one of the vastest empires in the Muslim world. But does that automatically mean that they would have the relics of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, as well as the sword of Imam Ali alayhi salam? Further than that, does this sword have a mystical significance or not? Because in the eyes of some, a sword is a sword. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi could have had a sword. Maybe Rasulullah had maybe more than seven swords, in fact, throughout his life. A sword is a sword. There doesn't need to be a mystical significance, whether it's the sword of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi or the sword of any other companion. But the reality is that when a person looks at this particular sword, this sword, Dhul Fiqar, has a mention in a number of the historical works. If I go to Al Kamil Fit Tariq of Ibn Al Athir, I see a discussion on Dhul Fiqar. If I go to the Tariq of Ibn Asakir, I see a discussion on Dhul Fiqar. If I go to Tabari's Tariq, I see a discussion on Dhul Fiqar. If I go to Tirmidhi, there's a discussion on Dhul Fiqar. If I go to Ibn Majah, there's a discussion on Dhul Fiqar. Let alone the Shia literature, where if a person goes into Al Kafi of Sheikh Al Kulaini, there is a discussion of Dhul Fiqar. Therefore, Dhul Fiqar wasn't an ordinary sword that history did not want to open up about. On the contrary, Dhul Fiqar represented a period of bravery, honor, dignity, whether it was in the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, or in the hands of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. But were we to examine the history of this sword, a number of important points emerge. And notably, above all else, 
the sacrifices of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam in Islam's most difficult moments. Because whenever anyone hears about Dhul Fiqar, then automatically a person thinks that this is the sword of Ali. But why would it become famous when thousands of other companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, they all had swords. Why in particular the sword of Ali would become a sword that everyone would remember? There are others who have gone to battles with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Others who went to Badr, Uhud, Khandaq, Khaybar, Hunayn. Others who went to wars. But you never hear others whose swords are mentioned alongside their names. But when it comes to Dhul Fiqar, automatically it's associated with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Let us tonight examine the history and the origin of Dhul Fiqar. And I'd like to do this in the following stages. Number one, what is the meaning of Dhul Fiqar or Dhul Fiqar or Dhul Fakar? And how does it have a relation to the meaning for the word poor in the Arabic language? Number two, when it comes to Sunni literature, what is the opinion about the origin of Dhul Fiqar? Are all Sunni ulama in agreement about Dhul Fiqar and its origin or not? Number three, how important are the armaments and the armors and the swords and the rings and the sticks of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And what mystical dimension do they carry? And which opinion is given that one prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala received this as a gift from a particular royal family way before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Then after that, what happened on the day of Badr and then the day of Uhud? And how is it that Jibra'il himself commented about the exploits of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam on the day of Uhud where the companions ran away an Imam remained with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Number five, when it comes to this Dhul Fiqar, did it remain with Imam Ali alayhi salam? And what happened when he died? Did it move on to Imam al Hassan alayhi salam? Number six, did Imam al Hussein alayhi salam use Dhul Fiqar in Karbala or not? Number seven, what is the relationship between Dhul Fiqar and Imam al Rada alayhi salam when he was asked about Dhul Fiqar? Number eight, how is Dhul Fiqar related to the Imam of our time? And how important is it for us to understand its position in relation to the Imam of our time? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. Many people, when they see Dhul Fiqar, they're enchanted by it. Many want to wear a necklace of it. Many want to place it on their wall. But if you ask many, what does Dhul Fiqar actually mean? you'll find that many are not actually able to give you a definition. If you look at the word Dhul Fiqar or the title Dhul Fiqar with the couple of words associated with it, you'll see that a number of opinions have emerged as to the meaning. If you look in the Arabic language, the word for the spinal cord is what? If you ask any of the Arabs about their spinal cord, they'll say to you that it is known as Al-Amud al faqari the spinal cord. The vertebrae in the spinal cord are known as faqarat. So if you've got the spinal cord, you imagine the spinal cord is known as the amud al faqari. And the vertebrae on the spinal cord are known as faqarat. You notice here, therefore, that there is a relationship between the shape of that spine and the shape of the vertebrae in relation to. The title, Dhul Fiqar. Why? Because one opinion that's given is that when Imam al-Sadiq was asked about why it's got this title, he said because it's like it has that spine going down the middle of it. If you look at, imagine Dhul Fiqar, in the normal way that we think of the depiction of Dhul Fiqar, and of course, that particular depiction that we have today may not be the exact one, but one opinion is that there is a small line in the middle of that sword. Even if you imagine the Fiqar, as you imagine that sword, it seems that right in the middle, there seems to be what is like a spine, a line right down cut through the middle. One opinion, therefore, 
was in the same way you have al-amud al-faqari, likewise, there is that spine shape in the middle of the sword. A second opinion was no, more related to the vertebrae in the spine. That maybe the sword was a sword that was like any other sword, but it might have had, for example, on top of the sword or within the middle of the sword, there may have been what looked like similar to the shape of the vertebrae on the spinal cord. And that's why you find that when you come to examining what is the word for poor in Arabic, when someone is poor in Arabic, he is known as faqir. Why is he known as faqir? Because the spinal cord of this person, because of their poverty, it's like it's become hunched their back. It's as if it's a heavy load on their spine. Notice that in the Arabic language, sometimes the word miskin is used, sometimes the word faqir. Both of them indicate that within the body of the human being, there's a certain amount of pressure that they're not able to take. Either sometimes you'll find that the spine, because of the heavy load that you have to carry, or because of the burden that you carry, burden can be both metaphorical and literal. Literally, because I'm poor, I find that I may have to carry certain things to earn. Metaphorically, the burden of the people around me is what I have to carry. True? A person, when they are poor, they in many cases have to carry a burden, sometimes embarrassment, sometimes begging, sometimes asking, that has an effect metaphorically as if their spine is breaking. Because that person does not have that back where they are able to walk around with strength because poverty has affected them. What do we call them? Whenever you see anyone poor, you think of the word faqir, think of the spinal cord of the human being. Think of the spine and how that person's spine, he may have no spine because his family may have neglected him. The community may have neglected him. And hence the word in Arabic was faqir. Therefore, the first opinion was, think of the spine and then think of that shape through the sword. The second opinion was, think of the vertebrae on the spine and then think of that image on top of the sword. Another opinion which was given was that the opinion of the two barbs on the sword, Dhul Fiqar. Another opinion was the opinion of the two edges on the sword, Dhul Fiqar. Most of the time, whenever a person imagines the look of Dhul Fiqar, what do they imagine? They imagine that there is these two edges. For what reason? The reason being, on the one hand, if I am fighting my enemy, I can trap their sword in the middle of my sword. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, a number of times in his battles, he is able to put the sword of his enemies between his sword. And then he's got both swords in his arms. And then he looks at his enemy at that moment. Another opinion was that no, that yes, that is there with the double edge, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's how the sword looks like. There is an opinion that the sword looked like the swords of Yemen and that the sword that we have, the look that we have today, is not exactly the same look as was there in what is the arms of Imam Ali or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Irrespective, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam gives another opinion. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, when he is asked about Dhul Fiqar, or sometimes people pronounce it as Dhul Fiqar, or Dhul Faqar, Imam al-Baqir was asked, he looked at that word and said in the same way that this sword is a separator, quite literally, when it goes through someone's body, metaphorically as well, it separates the enemy from their family in this world, and separates them from heaven in the hereafter. Because anyone who's going to fight, whoever possesses Dhul Fiqar, whether it's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, or whether it's Imam Ali alayhi salam, whoever's going to fight is going to be an enemy. It's going to be one of the disbelievers, the polytheists of Quraysh, the aristocrats, the nobles of the enemies of Rasulullah. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam says, imagine it as the separator. The separator meaning what? Meaning that it separates that person from their family or it separates them from the people of heaven for they go towards hell. Therefore, taking all of these opinions on board, at the end of the day, 
when we come to looking at the Sunni literature on this, no doubt, as I mentioned, Dhul Fiqar is mentioned within Sunni books. The Sunni literature could not cover Dhul Fiqar. At the end of the day, Dhul Fiqar was seen as the most famous of all swords. If you look within Sunni literature, what do you find? In Sunni literature, you'll see that there's a couple of opinions that emerge. One school of the Sunni world said that this was a sword that wasn't a heavenly sword in any way. This was a sword that belonged to one of the Quraysh by the name of Al-As ibn Munabbih or Munabbih bin Hajjaj, two different opinions which are given. They say that this was one of the people who was in the opposition in the battle of Badr. If you look, for example, Ibn Majah mentions that in the battle of Badr, part of the spoils of the booty from the opposition, when the Muslims had defeated the opposition, part of the booty was what? Was Dhul Fiqar. Go today to one of the Sahah works like we've been examining this whole month. You'll see that Ibn Majah says, that this was from the spoils of the battle of Badr. Belonged to who? Belonged to Al-As bin Munabbih. Al-As bin Munabbih was killed by who? Was killed by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam in the battle of Badr. When Imam Ali killed him, Imam brought the sword to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and you found that this was the Sunni opinion that was given. That what? That when it was given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Rasulullah kept it, until when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi died, it was passed on to who? It was passed on to Imam Ali alayhi salam. In the Sunni world, no one denies that Dhul Fiqar was passed from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to Imam Ali alayhi salam. No one denies this. But they limit the dimension of the Dhul Fiqar to not being something mystical or spiritual, simply spoils of war. And from these spoils of war, Ibn Majah mentions that it was given to Rasulullah. Rasulullah gives it to Imam Ali alayhi salam. But that not to be generalized for the whole Sunni world. Why? Sometimes when a person sees members of the Sunni community in Pakistan or in Turkey or elsewhere, they have a love for Dhul Fiqar, a reverence for Dhul Fiqar. It is symbolic for them, whether in art or calligraphy. So why do they get that idea? Because... In other areas of Sunni literature, how is Dhul Fiqar mentioned? Ibn Asakir, Tabari, Al Kamil Fitarikh, all of these, when you examine them, they give a more mystical dimension to Dhul Fiqar than simply being the booty of war. What do I mean? We know very well that there are certain artifacts, there are certain armaments. There are certain areas of that which was the relics of the prophets of Allah which belong to them. We know very well that they have a mystical dimension. I ask you, normally a staff, a staff or a stick that you stand on or you use for walking, normally what's so special about it? It's just a staff. When Moses alayhi salam, when his staff becomes magic, what happens to that staff? That staff automatically becomes something that has a mystical element related to it. Automatically, what otherwise is a normal stick or staff that I may walk around with, I may graze with, I may use to help support me. But when Moses alayhi salam puts down that staff and you have a number of things that happen. On the one hand, you have, for example, it becoming the snake and that snake defeats what? It defeats the magicians of Pharaoh. On the other hand, the Red Sea opens up so that the children of Israel are able to cross. That staff, any other place in the world, would be just a normal stick. No one would bat an eyelid. But because Moses السلام, touched it, automatically there is a special spiritual mystical significance to it. A ring. You look at a ring, for example. A ring. Is something normal, basic. People wear it in all cultures. But when Nabi Sulaiman salam wears a ring, it's a completely different story. Imam al-Sadiq salam says the whole authority and kingdom of Nabi Sulaiman salam was in his ring. His ring, the moment he would wear it, the jinns 
and the birds, all types of animals, would automatically be under his authority. As if they were the microcosm of the macrocosm of the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You look at Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, where's the ring? That ring becomes different to anyone else. Nabi Musa holds a staff. It becomes different to anyone else. Wudu, when you do wudu, your water drops are normal. But when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi does wudu with water, you see the companions at Hudaybiyah, which mystified Urwa bin Mas'ud al-Taqafi, where they saw companions jumping to have the water that touched Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Therefore, when a person has artifacts like a staff, like a ring of a Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it highlights that there are certain artifacts that have a mystical element. And that's why even in Shia thought, we believe that these artifacts, whether they belong to Sulaiman and the ring, whether they belong to Musa and his staff, on the one hand, a number of these were kept in the Tabut al Sakina. You all know the Tabut al Sakina and the story of David and Goliath and the children of Israel. That Tabut, you all know what the Tabut is, like that box. That Tabut, which we associate today with janazas and a coffin. That Tabut, why was it important for the children of Israel? Because that Tabut was a source of ilm, a source of guidance, a source of spirituality. They, while they looked after that tabut, inside it was the stick of Moses. Inside it was what else? Inside it at the same time was also the ring of Sulaiman and other artifacts. When the children of Israel neglected these things, then they were in the wilderness. Therefore, for us, in the ahadith in Al-Kafi of Sheikh Al-Kulayni, our imams mention very clearly that number one, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam inherited a number of things from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The gray mule of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam inherited. What else did he inherit? The saddle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. What else did he inherit? The sword of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. What else did he inherit? The coat of mail of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. All of these Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib inherited from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Not any other companion. Nobody else. Why? Because as Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, when he talks about how the Imams inherit these, he says the silah, the armament, the armor that we the Imams inherit are for us like the tabut of Bani Israel. You want to know who is the leader of Rasul after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Then look at who has inherited the armor of those who have come in the past. Who has inherited the ring of Sulaiman, the turban of Rasulullah, the armor and the coat of mail of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Who has inherited the staff of Musa. And that's why we believe Imam al-Mahdi, Allah Faraj al-Sharif. The Mahdi, when he returns, that staff of Moses will speak against those who doubt him from the children of Israel. Why? Because those are not just weapons. Those are weapons that have touched the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hence, you have a second opinion, which is what? Which is that the queen of Sheba gifted Dhul Fiqar to Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam. That's the second opinion. That the queen of Sheba gifted Dhul Fiqar to Nabi Sulaiman. The prophets inherit and they inherit the tabut, that holy grail, which some people in the Middle East are thinking more about than anything when they dig into the temples. There are many who want that tabut as sakina of David and Solomon. There are many who are digging under the earth. In Jerusalem, in Palestine, all of these areas. What? Looking for what? Looking for this tabut. Because they know within it, there is guidance, there is wisdom, there is knowledge, there is a relation to the mystical dimension. And no one thing, my dear brothers and sisters. Shiism remains the school in Islam that continued the mystical legacy of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you go to other schools of Islam, after Rasulullah dies, becomes Arab caliphates and Arab kingdoms. Arabs with Arabs, fighting Arabs, conquering Arabs, conquering other lands. Whereas Shiism, the legacy of Moses and Sulaiman and their armor and their artifacts and their armaments remains with the Imams of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. So Imam al Sadiq and others in Al Kafi 
Go to Kitab al Hujja and al Kafi. Look at the section on the armor, the armaments, the artifacts that were inherited by the Imams from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Did the Imams just inherit these? Because what? Because I've got a stick at home and a ring at home and a turban at home. And no, the Imams inherited that which has a mystical dimension, that which can speak, that which is able to defeat empires just through touching it, just through wearing it, just through holding it. So therefore, you found that that was another opinion. But then in Al Kamil fi Tariq and Tariq Ibn Asakir and Tabari and within our literature. That the greatest moment that occurs with the fiqar was where? Was in the battle of Uhud. You see, sometimes people say that the fiqar was given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They say, some try to put forward, like in the film, the message that Imam Ali was already in possession of the fiqar in the battle of Badr. Others said, no, this is not historically accurate. If it was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Rasulullah could have given it to Imam Ali at Badr. But more famously, if it is from the spoils of Badr, let's say, the Sunni side tried to go towards which opinion? They tried to go towards the opinion that this is just from the spoils that had belonged to randoms. No, for us, on the contrary. Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, of the number of swords that he had, he had Dhul Fiqar in his possession. He could have given it to Imam Ali, alayhi salam, at Badr comfortably. But where was it more famous where we heard about Dhul Fiqar? Was in the battle of Uhud. Why in the battle of Uhud? Because in the battle of Uhud, Rasulullah became so angry with his companions on that day. Why? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had been on the top of the mountain. He had been placed there. He had placed all his companions there, sorry. And he turned around to his companions and he said to them amongst them, Abdullah al-Ansari, Jabir's father, and others, he said to them, whatever you do, do not leave this mountain. Because some of them were thinking that in the battlefield, there is a situation where Ali is in the battlefield, and Hamza is in the battlefield, Mus'ab bin Umar is in the battlefield, Ammar bin Yasser, ferocious warriors were in the battlefield. They thought, you know what? We destroyed the opposition at Badr. Now it's Uhud. Us guys are stuck on the mountain. Those guys are going to achieve victory. There's all this booty and spoils of war and armors and shields and swords. Because you know, not all Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi's companions had gone to battle with the pure near. Some had gone either because they hated the opposition. Others had gone to collect the spoils of war. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was there on the top of Uhud. And he loved Uhud. And he said, Uhud loves us. But he made clear. Abdullah al-Ansari, others do not leave this mountain. Khalid ibn al-Walid, one of the leaders of the opposition on that day, he said he'll come round and he'll attack. When in the middle of the battle, you all know the story, in the middle of the battle, two things happened. Hamza bin Abd al-Muttalib, uncle of Rasulullah and Imam Ali, alayhim salam Hamza alayhi salam got killed by the spear of Wahshi. Also, Mus'ab bin Umar got killed. When Mus'ab bin Umar got killed, the shout went, Muhammad is dead. Why? Because some said that Mus'ab bin Umar looked like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. In that moment, some companions were like, even if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is dead, Islam remains alive. We have to keep fighting. Others began to run away from the battle. I don't want to look at hadith. Let's just look at the Quran. In the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, all of you know the verses Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa ma Muhammadun illa Rasul. Qad khalat min qablih al-Rasul. Afa in mata aw qutila in qalabtum ala aqabikum. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is but a messenger of Allah. And messengers have come before him. If he dies, or rather he is killed, all of you turn back on you, your heels, you companions who are meant to be loyal to him. All of a sudden, you hear the cry that he's died. You run away from the battlefield. When they ran away, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi became so angry. Why? Number one, the disloyalty of those who had stabbed him in the back and who had run away. Number two, not listening to his orders. Number three, Rasulullah found himself on the mountain of Uhud 
fighting against those who are coming against him. You have some schools of Islam who try and report that his teeth were broken and that he had been attacked. That's an opinion of certain schools. Although no one was as brave as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, But who was with him on that day? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib noticing people running away. I'm telling you him and a few others. Not more than three, four had gone to the mountain of Uhud to protect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Remember one thing. That it was around that time, it was coming to a year of the anniversary of his wedding to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Imagine your one year anniversary. When Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam had offered at that time for his mahar, when the Prophet asked him, what do you want to give for the mahar? And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam had turned around to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and said to him, that I could give my shield or I could give my sword or I could give, for example, my horse. Rasulullah at that time had told him, keep your sword for the defense of the religion of Islam. Yes? That time, why did Rasulullah tell Imam Ali, don't give your sword as mahar, as dowry for the, for the wedding of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? Because there'll be a day like this. A day where you carry that sword with the best of ways. And what a devastating performance. My dear brothers and sisters, understand one thing, to be alone on that mountain. And to have all of these come towards you. Because you know, on that day, Imam pierced through the opposition army. They feared him more than they feared anyone else. This one particular tribe, Banu Abd al-Dar, if I'm not mistaken. They were the ones protecting. They were the flag bearers. One by one, each brother, he killed him. Seven brothers. He finished them all off. They came to the top of the mountain. Imagine Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Those who were called later the best companions and God knows who. I don't know where they are in these battles. I don't know who's where. I don't know who's ran away where. You do your research and you'll see who remained loyal. Even a lady remained more loyal to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi than some of those who held positions in Islam. That lady came. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was there defending in every way whatsoever. And Jibra'il and the other angels were watching in awe. Yes? You know, it doesn't surprise me. When people look at Surah Al-Hadid, you all know Surah Al-Hadid. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah 57 verse 25, when he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, inna anzalna al-Hadida fihi ba'sun shadeed wa manafi'u lil-nas. This iron that Allah has sent down, that iron, they say metaphorically, that refers to what? That is Dhul Fiqar, that Allah sent as one of the ta'wils of this ayah. That Dhul Fiqar was that sword that Allah had sent to make sure that it benefited mankind. Yes? It wasn't just to be taken as, oh Allah sent down inna anzalna al-hadida fihi ba'su shadidun wa manafi' al-nas. No, no. Rather, it was that there is a particular sword that will benefit people in the most unbelievable way. On that day in Uhud, Jibra'il looks and he tells Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, what an unbelievable show of devotion from the son of Abu Talib. That while all others claim to love Rasulullah, where are their swords when he's alone on the mountain? One's running this way, the other's running that way. You found Imam Ali ibn Talib, Jibra'il was in awe. And Rasulullah, what did he say? He said very clearly that he is from me and I am from him. Imagine. That Ali minni wa ana minhu. Imagine those lines. Ali is from me and I am from him. How many times does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa have to repeat to the ummah? That these Ahlul Bayt are from me and I am from them. Hussein is from me and I am from him. Ali minni wa ana minhu. And imagine Jibra'il says, and I am with the both of you. And then the traditions mention that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi looks up and he hears a call saying what? La fata illa Ali. وَلَا سَيْفَ إِلَّا ذُو الْفِقَارِ there, no, there is no youth but Ali. No chivalrous youth of futuwa, of chivalry. Like Ali ibn Abi Talib. And there is no sword but ذُو الْفِقَارِ 
Those lines remained etched on that day in Uhud. And that's why while Ibn Majah mentions as he tries to point that this is just from the spoils of Badr, Tirmidhi talks about a vision related to the Fiqar in Uhud. No one could deny that on that day in Uhud that there was a call that had come out. La sayfa illa dhul fiqar wa la fata illa ali. So sometimes people say la fata illa ali wa la sayfa illa dhul fiqar. Sometimes in the hadith the other way around. There is no sword but dhul fiqar. And there is no chivalrous, chivalrous youth like Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imam Ali on that day, by the way, how old was he? How old on the day of Uhud? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib on that day was coming to his 25th birthday. We're not talking about someone in his 50s. No, no. Those in their 50s. One was running one way and the other was running another. Whereas the one in his mid-20s, he had sacrificed his life on that day and made it clear the heavens were looking at his strike. The heavens were looking at his bravery. You know when it says, La fata illa Ali? Doesn't mean there's no youth but Ali. Fata, futuwa, one of its meanings is young. Another is the chivalrous one who at a young age has the composite of all virtues in one human being. Dignity, honor, perseverance, patience, bravery, valor, fortitude, sacrifice for the religion of Islam. How dare people compare? How dare they compare a man who gives his life away to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, on that mountain of Uhud Whereas others are running left, right, and center. And they have to make excuses for those others. Otherwise, the paradigm becomes a problem. The framework becomes a problem. So what are the excuses? Well, you know, it's not just about how many you killed. Rasulullah didn't kill many. So it's not just about how many you killed. Come on, give me a break. I thought you'd be better than that. Come on. Rasulullah didn't kill many. Therefore, if others didn't kill many, or they're not known for their exploits, are you saying Rasulullah is not brave? You throw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi under the bus so that you protect others. And that's why it's no surprise that that day of Uhud belonged to him. As Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam would mention in his khutbah in Sham, I am the son of the man who fought at Badr, Uhud and Hunayn. Why? Number one, Uhud was a victory or stopped the victory of Hind. Muawiyah's mother against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi because of the combination and the teamwork and the duo that was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imagine, Ali is from me and I am from him. And Jibra'il says, and I am with the both of you. I am from the both of you. Imagine that triumvirate. Jibra'il, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Imam Ali. What do they all have in common? Number one, they're all chosen by Allah. Number two, they have never bowed down to an idol. They didn't need to be brought up in a world where their families were all idol worshippers and the worst of Quraysh. There was the purity of a line from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jibra'il, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and Imam Ali alayhi salam. And that's why, like we said, on that day, لا فتاة إلا علي ولا سيفة إلا ذو الفقار On the day of Khandaq, you all read the hadith, ضربة علي يوم الخندق the strike of Ali on the day of Khandaq, the strike of Ali at Uhud, the strike of Ali at Badr. But then just in case someone wants to tell me, anyone could have done it, it wasn't just Ali, then you come to Khaybar and you look at Ali ibn Abi Talib in Khaybar. And when you see him in Khaybar, you see Dhul Fiqar, he's playing, it's just enjoyable for him. Of course he couldn't be at the battle, he had an eye infection. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, says that I will give the banner to a man. Allah and me love him. And he loves me and Allah. Why does he say that? Because everyone can claim they love Allah and the Prophet. But when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, I'm going to give the banner to that man, that's the indication that I know which ones of you are truly the ones who love me and Allah and which are the hypocrites in reality amongst you. You look at that battle of Khaybar, Imam Ali had an eye infection, therefore he could not fight. So when Rasulullah said that, everyone was wondering, is it me? Is it me? And the hadiths are clear that everybody had tried to conquer Khaybar. Abu Bakr had tried, no point. Umar had tried, nowhere near. Everybody else had tried, no one could conquer. Marhab, 
and the others, the fortress of the Jews at Khaybar. No one could come near. Who is it that comes near? Who is it in reality? It's one man and one man alone. But then someone asked, but he had an eye infection. He couldn't. And that's why when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that I'm going to give the banner to a man. Allah and me love him. And he loves me and Allah. People thought, who is it? Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? It can't be Ali because he's not going to fight. He's got an eye infection. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, bring Ali to me. When Imam Ali Ali ibn Talib was brought to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Rasulullah took the saliva and he placed it in the eye of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam said, after that day, I did not see like when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did that to me. Imagine Ali ibn Abi Talib, if his vision half full can destroy the opposition. What if he has the best eyesight? He went out. And when he went out on that battle, imagine the scene, my dear brothers and sisters. Dhul Fiqar in one hand and the fort of Khaybar in another. And wallah, only a hater of Ali ibn Abi Talib cannot appreciate such things. There are many non-Shia in the world who love Mawla. Many adore him. But you'll always find non-Shia who also cannot stand his merits. They'll look to do anything to try and reject his merits. A harrani here and a harrani there. So what happens is, that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam comes forward. And you all know the lines. When Imam Ali comes forward, and what did he say? And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib made it clear that I'm the one whose mother named him what? Because Marhab had seen in his dream that a lion would kill him. So Marhab's thinking, why did I see a dream? I'm the greatest warrior of the Jews. I've seen a dream that a lion will kill me. And the Imam came out on the battlefield and said, I'm the one whose mother named him Haydar. In Arabic, there are different words for lion. Asad is lion. Laith is lion. All of these you will see are all different words for lion. Haydar is lion. You go to Dargham. All of these are different types of lions. The lion, the ferocious state, the lion who's going to destroy you, who's going to rip you apart, the lion who's ready. He said, I'm the one whose mother named him Haydar. Ana alladhi sammatni ummi Haydara. Dargamun ajamun wa laythun qaswara. But then he went on to bring the word faqar somewhere in those lines of poetry. I'll strike you a strike. Whatever spine you have, whatever vertebrae you have, it'll destroy it inside out. And imagine you're in the opposition and you hear him say, you know that you're going to be destroyed. You're going to be separated, slashed, one way or the other. That Dhul Fiqar with Ali ibn Abi Talib was the perfect combo you'll ever see. They never in their life were defeated on the battlefield. No one could come near them. And that's why on the day of Jamal against Aisha, he was proud to use Dhul Fiqar. He was proud to use it against Talha and Zubair because we remain Shi'at Ali on that day. We know very well that Aisha's army of Talha, Zubair and their lovers remain until today. There's no doubt. They have to protect the woman and the companions that their life story. But Shi'at Ali on that day, we are behind the man who held Dhul Fiqar. Who you had to go back groveling with, with your head down, seeking forgiveness for the fitna that you caused in Islam. And the same man at Safin. Muawiyah, come here. Let me do to you what I did to your grandfather at Badr. I'll destroy you the same way. Have you forgotten Abu Hassan? And have you forgotten what I do with my sword? No one can come near him on the battlefield, however many are others you try to bring. And that's why people ask the question that that sword of his, Dhul Fiqar, did it remain with him? Yes, it remained with him until he died. Then it gets passed from Imam to Imam, from Imam to Imam. First question, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, did he have Dhul Fiqar? Yes, he did. Did he use it in Karbala? No. He left Dhul Fiqar with the other possessions of the Hashemites with his brother Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. Because he knew these people would loot. For goodness sake, look what they did to his body. On the plains of Karbala. Then it was passed on to Imam Zain Abidin, Imam Al-Baqir, Imam Al-Saliq, Imam Al-Kadhim, Imam Al-Rada. 
Imam Rada alayhi was asked about Dhul Fiqar, he said, yes, it's in our possession. And it gets passed on from one Imam to another. It's a sign of the Imam that the Imam has Dhul Fiqar. And then from Imam al Rada, Imam al Jawad, Imam al Hadi, Imam al Askari until Imam al Hujjah. Ajal Allah Faraj al Sharif. We reject this idea that it went to the Hassanid lines and then to the Abbasids. We reject the idea that it's in Top Kapi Museum in Istanbul with all our respect for those who live in Turkey and who may admire and have their museums for tourism. Our reading is that that Dhul Fiqar remained with the Imams. An important point here. Many Shia, we love to have the necklace of Dhul Fiqar. Some went to the direction of having a tattoo of Dhul Fiqar. Others, out of their adoration, have a Dhul Fiqar at home. It is more important that we embody the metaphorical lessons from that sword than just have it stuck on our chests or on our necklaces. Yes, as an identifier, I love seeing someone who's wearing a Dhul Fiqar or has one at home. But I'd rather see that that person has the bravery of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, the honor and the dignity of Imam, the akhlaq of the Imam, the patience of the Imam, the forbearance of the Imam. That is when a person entrenches la fata illa Ali wa la sayfa illa dhul fiqar. If I am someone who has dhul fiqar on my neck and I am not ready to be of those who praise salah, then what's the point of having this necklace and I don't even pray? I am someone who has the dhul fiqar, but I drink that which should not be drunk, eat that which shouldn't be eaten. Then what's the point? Then I have not in that way understood the significance of that dhul fiqar. That in one way, if I am not someone who is ready to be proud of their tashayyu and is always hiding, then how am I honoring the man who was proud to say that he was on that path and his companions were always loyal to him? It's a shame. When you see people who know لا فتاة إلا علي ولا سيفة إلا ذو الفقار but have hardly picked up نهج البلاغة in their year or in their lives to read some of the maxims of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Reality is that I also want to look. Did Imam Ali look after the orphans? Yes, he did. Have I ever looked after an orphan? Did Imam disseminate knowledge? Have I sponsored that knowledge? The reality is لا فتاة إلا علي ولا سيفة إلا ذو الفقار that ذو الفقار is a symbol for us to never forget the principles of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Whatever principles he left behind for us, it was vital for us to try and look at that sword all the time and say, I want to live up to your message and to your criteria and to your standard. For you are a man who in terms of fighting the oppressor, you were the first to stand up. But at the same time, you are a man of unbelievable bravery. You are a man. If there was others in the opposition, it didn't matter who they were. If they were ready to fight you and your Shia, you decimated them. But at the same time, your heart was the softest heart. You know that sometimes they say that when someone fought him one-on-one, -on -one, and if his dhul fiqar, if we were to take the idea of the shape that we see today, if it trapped the other person's sword, then the person would look at him and he'd say, Ali says yes. Imagine he's got his sword and dhul fiqar, and he looks at him and says, and imagine he looks at the Imam, knowing the Imam has both swords. And he says to him, they say you never reject when someone asks you. Imam says, tell me. He said, give me my sword back. Imam throws him his sword back. The person says, I want to join your side. He said, no, don't say my side. Say the side of truth and justice. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam was not a bloodthirsty man. But rather that sword and the wealth of Khadija were there to serve Islam. To protect Islam. Jamal, Safin, Nahrawan. Imam had made clear that it's not us who want to go out and fight. Aisha wants to fight us. Talha wants to fight us. Zubair wants to fight us. Muawiyah wants to fight us. Amr ibn al-As wants to fight us. These are the ones who want to fight us. We are ready to defend ourselves. Otherwise, we don't just pick up a sword willy-nilly going around. Killing people. That is not the ethos of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Rather... His ethos was that even the man who struck me, if his one strike with his sword kills me, then you only kill him with one strike. Others could have easily turned around and said that that man Ibn Muljam, la'natullah alayhi. They could have easily said that, make sure that you mutilate his body. This is my Dhul Fiqar, O Hassan. Cut him up into pieces. No. Says, oh my son, that if that person's one strike with his sword happens to kill me and I die, then you only strike him with one strike. 
Imam wanted to highlight that at the end of the day, justice will remain even after I pass away. Imagine for us, we never met him. And yet we break down when we remember such principles and such sacrifice. Imagine then those who met the Imam. Imagine those who were alongside the Imam, around the Imam on a night like this. Night 21 of the holy month of Ramadan is one of the most difficult nights. And that's why the Imam had turned around to all those around him. From his family, from his companions, he began to bid each one of them farewell. One by one, the Imam began to bid them farewell. He asked each and every one of them. He said to each and every one of them that make sure that I advise you, my dear children, sons of Abdul Muttalib, be conscious of Allah. Steadfast in your religion. Don't yearn for this world. And nor should you be seduced by it. Oppose the oppressor. Support the oppressed. Don't resent anything that you've missed in it. Reconcile your differences. Strengthen your ties. For reconciliation of differences is greater than that recommended prayer or fast. Then you find that after that he would tell them, Fear Allah in relation to the orphans. Fear Allah in relation to your prayers. Fear Allah in relation to his house. Fear Allah in relation to jihad. Fear Allah in relation to your relatives. If this one strike of Ibn Muljam happens to kill me, then only strike him with one strike. Don't mutilate his body. For Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi said that you shouldn't even mutilate the body of a dog with rabies. All of a sudden, the cries of the tears of the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi got louder and louder in the house of Amir al muminin in Kufa. Imagine the tears of Zainab alayhi salam on a night like this and the tears of of Umm Kulthum and the tears of Umm al and the other ladies of Al Muhammad, one holding the other, one crying with the other, one disconsolate with the other. And the Imam turned towards Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. He said to him, My son Hassan, come near me. Imam al Hassan came near him. And the Imam looked towards him. He said, All of you, the Imam after me is Imam al Hassan alayhi salam all of you come one by one and pledge your allegiance to your imam one by one the household came my dear brothers and sisters one by one the household came imagine imam al Hussein coming to imam al Hassan to pledge his allegiance Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya coming to imam al Hassan to pledge his allegiance imagine seeing the others who were there one by one and imagine Imagine at this moment Umm al seeing all the sons pledging their allegiance and wondering why isn't he called my Abbas. At this moment the poets depict the scene. It's as if the Imam said, call me, call me, Abba al-Fadl, bring him near me. Why? I asked them all to pledge their allegiance to Hassan. But I wanted you to pledge your allegiance to both Hassan and Hussein. What's he saying in this way? He's saying, number one, you'll live to tell the tale that you'll see both of them in their final moments. Can you imagine the scene when he takes the hands of Abel Fadl at this moment? Protect him. Protect him with what? Protect him with both your arms and protect him with your eyes. I ask all of you, did Abbas protect protect Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He gave away his arms and he gave away his eyes and he gave away all his body for Aba Abdullah. He made sure they all came near him, but especially Zainab alayhi salam. Why? Because for Zainab alayhi salam, he knew that all of these will be there to live, but there'll be a day they'll pass away, but Zainab will have to pick up the pieces. He more 
Lord Zainab and Um Kulthum near him. The poet says it's as if he touched them on their face and he touched them on their back. Why would the poet describe it in this way? Because some of those faces would be slapped and others of them would be hit. Imagine all of them now, they've all gathered together and then one by one as they're coming near him, they're looking at him in the final moments and then all of a sudden they heard the Imam look at his father and say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon Rahimallah man nada wa aliyya wa shahida wa imama Imagine all of them around the house at this moment all of them holding each other. Zainab on this day, she had her brothers to hold her. Alhamdulillah Imam al-Hassan held Zainab Imam al-Hussein held Zainab. I ask you on the night of the 11th of Muharram who was there to hold Zainab when she looked at the body of her brothers lying on the earth of Karabala. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayya'lamu alladhina zalamu ayya munqalabin yanqalibun wa la'nati da'ima ala al-qawm al-dhalimeen. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Allow us to be with the Imam of your time, Imam Sahib al Hasr wa Zaman. Allow our eyes one day to be looking at Dhul Fiqar and to be next to it alongside the Imam of our time. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all those around us that Allah gives them the chance to do ziyarat Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam and for them to get the shafa'ah of Imam Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of our marhumin and all those who instilled in us the love of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Inshallah, tomorrow night we will continue with our discussions of the different topics that emerge from both Sunni and Shia literature. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the originators of this majlis as well, Imam al Hussein TV and their team, and all those behind the scenes at SayyidAmmar.com, all of our teams together. We pray for their marhumin with a surah al Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Make the upcoming Laylatul Qadr special for you and your family and bind your fate to the blessed shrine of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. On your behalf, a ziyarat can be performed in the holy city of Karbala. If you cannot make it to the holy land of Karbala this Ramadan, our staff can perform a complete ziyarat of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam with all the amal and rituals in the holy shrine on your behalf in appreciation for a sadaqah of 50 US dollars. We will also have your names and the names of your dear ones and marhumins put inside the holy zari alongside your wishes for this special night. This way, you have paid a sadaqah for the well-being of your family and a sadaqah jariya on behalf of your marhumin in the holy city of Karbala. By paying this sadaqah, you will also show the Imam of our time your support to the blessed cause of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. To reserve your ziyara and receive follow up videos and pictures of your names from the holy city and the holy shrine, WhatsApp us on the numbers displayed now on your screen. <laughs>